Hello and welcome to another video with me, Mioni, for Final Fantasy XIV. Today I wanted to finally go over the recent live letter, number 42. Now this happened at the weekend whilst I was away featuring Naoki Yoshida, the game director of Final Fantasy XIV. And in the live letter they started it off with a questions and answers section from people on the forums and on Twitter. Mentioning the reply to a tank question, it's mainly about whether they can allow DPS to use party related buffs to increase synergy. They want to know if they can reduce Shadow Wall's recast timer, and a complaint to this system came mostly from the Western audience. Yoshida says that the recast timer is set the way it is, so that it aligns with the content adjustments and the party buffs that came along. By adjusting this skill would affect other job skills as well, so the answer is shortly, mostly no. Next is about the substats of tanks. Yoshida is considering not implementing direct hit on tanks, but this would be temporary and the internal team is having discussions about it. Samurais and Red Mages didn't need any adjustments for 4.2, and Red Mage in particular will not receive any buffs where they can use anything but synergize for parties. However, for Samurais, the possibility is there due to Monk changes that were done recently. Because of Samurai being weaker than Monk, they are thinking of what to do, they're probably going to buff Samurai DPS. And as for Black Mages, they don't want to give Black Mage too many party utility abilities in the attempt to not break Black Mage's job identity. If they did give Black Mages utility, they would have to nerf Black Mages DPS very hard to compensate, they mention. And Yoshida is currently urging people to stop being too absorbed into thinking party utility is everything for a job. You can still contribute a winning point to your party. Apparently, after 4.2, there is an overwhelming number of GM petitions where players had accidentally put the wrong thing inside their glamour dresses and wanted to take it out. Although these problems are occurring, for now the team is planning to allow items to be put in the dresser to be recoverable and back into your inventory at a later date. Apparently one of the questions was about inventory slots. Yoshida is currently considering increasing it from 200 maximum. It is possible to do it, however programming wise it's quite difficult. But first they need to know how it will react to placing more items into the dresser. So first they need to do some testing. If it's feasible they will increase the maximum slots. The Calamity Salvager got mentions, they're asking if items lost from a MOG station can be repurchased from the Calamity Salvager. It's not going to be possible because the Calamity Salvager will only allow the items purchased if you have an achievement unlocked whilst you're doing a quest. There's no current way around it other than making it an armoire item. Also, they say they can't save colours into the armoire because it would increase the data size by a lot and wouldn't be feasible. On Bioco Extreme, there's a phase where you can use the tank limit break to mitigate the second tiger phase. To note, this is not intended by the developers to begin with, although they have noticed that this is something that people have invented themselves and are going to keep it and leave it alone. They want to look into Castrum and Praetorium and increasing the rewards from those main scenario dungeons simply because they don't believe the rewards are worth the time investment into them, even after the patch, where they incidentally increase the time you're actually in those dungeons by turning off the ability to skip the cutscenes. This was both to appease the new players to let them enjoy the storyline, but it also added a little bit of angst towards people who got it to pop, and instantly left, not wanting to even deal with main scenario cues at all. As for Beast Tribe dailies, there's a natural request to make the elephant mound look more like it's flying. Yoshida is happy to please people, however apparently he will not make it look like its ears are flapping, because they don't want to infringe on Dumbo, apparently. Next, apparently Triple Triad, people have moaned about not having the ability to use any 4 star cards really, you have a 5 star slot, there's not really much use for 4 stars, but apparently they're going to be eliminating the card cost needed to arrange your decks, and that they're considering making it so that you can use a wider variety of cards, so whatever that means, it's going to require some testing, but it's an improvement and it's probably on their list. Apparently there was a request to add category tabs for minions so you can find where they are actually from or different types of minions and they're going to be currently looking into that as well as something for mounts as well. So after all of these questions and answers and some of the ones that I've read out here there's some others that aren't that interesting. They actually did a huge section on Eureka and the majority of this video is simply going to be 
completely on Eureka. So let's actually look at that feature. So the Forbidden Land of Eureka is an unexplored, untamed wild where the very elements are constantly in flux. Whilst you're exploring Eureka and growing in strength, players will have the opportunity to obtain and enhance Eureka gear and weapons. Up to 144 players can occupy a single instance at any one time, and players are encouraged to cooperate with another group to progress. Players may form and disband parties with other players at will, and an alternate form of progression exists within Side Eureka. Apparently we're to think of the gathering and disbanding on something like Diadem, where you are free to join and leave as you please. Next up they show the Magia board, which is a new elemental system of upgrading your character. This is what they're talking about when they talk about player progression. Within Eureka, player strength is measured by their ability to endure and harness the elements, represented as their elemental level. All players will begin at elemental level 1 and may obtain a maximum elemental level of 20. This elemental level of 20 is only temporary and as the content expands in the future the level cap will also increase. So the amount of elemental XP gained may be affected by the number of players in a party and the difficulty of the enemies they defeat within Eureka. So the Magia board can be used in conjunction with Magisite to strengthen a player's affinities within the six elements whilst you're exploring the Forbidden Land of Eureka. A stronger affinity with a given element will increase the damage a player deals to certain enemies, as well as reduce the damage he or she receives from others. By spinning the Magia board, players can quickly arrange their elemental affinities. And here's a look at some of the icons that we're going to be seeing inside there, the various elements and what they look like artistically quite nice. So the elemental aspects of enemies. Enemies encountered in the Forbidden Land of Eureka are imbued with powers aspected to a particular element. Through judicious use of their magia boards, players can fight these enemies more efficiently. So obviously if something is a fire element, it's probably going to be weak to a water elemental player. And that player will also have high resistances to fire magic because of that water affiliation. If you're focusing on one element, you obviously deal more damage on a monster with opposing element of the specific one you're dealing. In return, you receive lesser damage. So penalties will actually be incurred when you're knocked out inside Eureka. When players are KO'd in the Forbidden Land Eureka, they will actually lose elemental experience. However, if they are revived by another player within 10 minutes of being KO'd, they will not suffer an elemental experience penalty. Furthermore, if a player's current elemental level is 5 or below, he or she will not lose elemental XP when KO'd. If a player's elemental level is 11 or higher, this penalty may reduce his or her elemental experience total below zero. Should this happen, the player will lose an elemental level. They do mention that Final Fantasy XI players will be more familiar with the scenery and the elements in this system. But they go on to a in-game demonstration of Eureka and the Rinkugane, which seems to be where you're going to be accessing Eureka itself via an NPC. You can also access this NPC to know more about elemental works inside Eureka and a huge set of information and tutorials on the various chain bonuses, etc. And Eureka itself is an actual instance, which you can queue for. Here's the actual instance pop-up here, and here's what it looks like when you go inside there with the Magia board UI pop-up on the left there. Apparently this will be fully fleshed out with a whole new storyline and new information, so obviously they're not going to skimp on that. And Kryle is one of the main NPCs focusing on this entire section and side story of this area. There are various vendors within Eureka, and a lot of the items that are consumable, such as potions and elixirs, are actually Eureka versions and can actually only be used inside here. They show off an area here on a map called the New Void and one of the other maps here with etherites listed, as you can see, for easy teleportation around Eureka. You cannot use mounts in Eureka, it was confirmed, until you're done with the actual expedition. So you can only walk and run until you finish your main goal of actually being there. And they show off some of the monsters here, which are spine-backed sort of monsters that look really cool. So they're showing off here that the water elemental of the player is 2, so you're receiving less damage from these water elemental monsters, and you can also rotate this UI as well. But elemental magia has a cost. Once you decide on what elemental power to use, you will use up one cost, and it will replenish after a certain amount of time. So you're spinning this board manually to get 
for example, fire element damage or ice elemental damage, whichever you want to choose from. But obviously the power of those will only depend on how many points you've placed into that elemental tree. The adjustments for the magic board is flexible as long as you're at the actual board. So they do note here that Yoshida is using a development build, so him receiving 50,000 damage and not dying is a deliberate setup to show you the examples of elemental resistances and how powerful they actually are to mitigate this sort of damage. The difference between having zero elemental level on water and taking damage from water, or having level one on water when taking damage from water elemental will be huge. And next they switch back to the PowerPoint to talk about Eureka's weapons and gear. While exploring Eureka, players may obtain Protean Crystals. These crystals may be used to obtain and enhance Eureka gear and weapons with the aid of Geralt from the Relic Quests. However, in order to fully upgrade the Eureka weapons, players will need to obtain a different item from a notorious monster somewhere in Eureka. Also, Enemos is the first release of a complex feature, so they're making the first quest simple. You're encouraged to look for parties whilst you're inside Eureka as well, either by shout or the usual recruitment methods, or using the player search to look for interested players. They show off some of the actual Eureka stuff here. This is possibly the Red Mage gear and Red Mage weapon for the first tier. So they're basically showing off here that you're capable of dying job equipment as soon as Eureka's actually implemented, because a lot of the items in previous Relic Quests were only dieable on their last stages, so that's pretty cool. So next they want to talk about Notorious Monsters. And in the Forbidden Land of Eureka, players may encounter exceptionally powerful enemies, and players will need to cooperate with others in the area in order to defeat them. Should they succeed, players will obtain significant elemental experience and other rewards. So these are like notorious monsters from Final Fantasy XI if you've ever played that. They also show a screenshot from the actual trailer, if you remember. This is actually one of those notorious monsters, which looks absolutely amazing. And they also show one of the rewards, which is this glamour set here, this scorpion outfit, which is pretty damn cool. They stress again that Final Fantasy XI players will be right at home when they look at Eureka, and they explain the implementation of Eureka on a .5 patch, because they want you to finish your raid and get the tombstone equipments gathered. And they also say that Eureka will be added to add more content for players, so that they can enjoy Eureka as another layer of content once players are done with raiding. And that's pretty much all the Eureka information we have. After the break, they just basically showed off a load of merch, they talked about the Sapporo Snow Festival with the amazing statue that we've talked about before and a release of the Primal's sort of concert album which is uh, basically live metal versions of Final Fantasy themes. They also talk about the Eorzean Symphony Orchestra concert that's heading over to the west. Uh, I think the European one is going to be in Frankfurt, Germany which is going to be interesting. So that's pretty much it for Live Letter Part 42. It's been interesting and more information about Eureka is always welcome. There's still a few things that obviously we don't know but from the information we have got it's very exciting exciting is something different and I'm excited to see what other bits of Final Fantasy XI they're planning to add to this system. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.